Welcome to the Eye on the Cure podcast, the podcast about winning the fight against retinal disease from the foundation fighting blindness. Welcome, everybody, to another installment of the Eye on the Cure podcast. I am Ben Shaberman, Senior Director of Scientific Outreach at the Foundation, and really glad you could join us for another episode of the podcast. And I'm delighted that for this episode, we have Jill Dolgen from AGTC, Applied Genetic Technologies Corporation. And Jill is the head of patient advocacy. And if you didn't know, AGTC is very active in our space. Uh, They are a clinical stage biotech and they're developing groundbreaking gene therapies for rare diseases. And in our space, we're excited because they have gene therapy clinical trials underway for both X-linked RP and achromatopsia. A little more about Jill. She leads the patient and professional engagement strategy to drive disease awareness and clinical trial recruitment efforts for the AGTC pipeline. She has more than 20 years of global biopharmaceutical experience in medical affairs, corporate communications, patient and professional advocacy, and public policy. Jill earned her PharmD from the University of the Sciences at Philadelphia, and she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Pharmacy from the Ohio State University. Go Buckeyes! Really glad that you could join us, Jill. And I was thinking um, as we were getting ready to record, you've been with the uh, with AGTC now for quite a few years. How long has it been exactly? And it's been four and a half years. Time has just flown by. It really has. It doesn't seem all that long ago when you began, but I was thinking when you began, there really weren't any clinical trials underway in for AGTC. So it's really exciting to see your work moving forward in the clinic. Um, and you're going to tell us more about that in, in just a, a little bit. But to start off, I was hoping you could tell us more about what it means to be a patient advocate. What what do you do in that role? I think just as the the quick summary of my role is to be responsible for ensuring that I understand the issues and challenges of our constituents. Um, In other words, We need to understand that patient journey, not just the individual, but the journey of the family as they're dealing with these rare conditions. Um, And so my role is to engage with those organizations as well as individuals to educate me, to educate them about that, uh, about the condition um, and help them make some informed decisions. Um, In other words, the more they know about their condition, whether it's getting that genetic test or whether it's seeing the right specialist, um, the more empowered they can be with that knowledge to make some decisions about going forward, including a clinical trial. Right. And and I think with clinical trials, it's really important (laughs) because people are anxious to get into clinical trials, but often they don't understand the risks, the commitment, it, it, it's not a trivial thing to be in a, a, a clinical trial for an emerging therapy. So I was wondering, how long have you actually been in patient advocacy? Did you do that before you came to AGTC? Well, as a matter of fact, um, starting in my early days as a clinical pharmacist, I would say that I've, I've always been a patient advocate. Um, I mean, a pharmacist's job is to educate their patients about their medication um, so that they understand how to take it. Um, so I would say that as early as my pharmacy days um, in understanding pharmacology and explaining it to my patients, it motivates those individuals to continue with their, with their care when they understand why it's important for them and for their condition to continue with their with their therapy. So it goes back many, many years um, as a clinical pharmacist, and I actually ran a regional poison center. So I can say that I've advocated for individuals and families um, by handling one phone call, one patient at a time. 
Um, but over the years in working in biopharmaceuticals um, and engaging with patient organizations like FFB, I feel like I'm impacting or helping more than one patient at a time. Um, by working with FFB, you are educated and learning about what we're doing. You can in turn interpret that information and explain it to your constituents. So having this dialogue and understanding um, the science and understanding the clinical trials that we're conducting, you can be that voice, uh, the credible voice for those physicians as well as those patients and families uh, to help them understand what's coming uh, in the future. Right. Well, we we do our best to keep people informed about what's happening on the research front. But something you, you said ca really caught my attention. You worked in, a, did you call it a poison control center? Yes. So were you answering calls from people who were concerned or in fact um, poisoned or taken a poison? Yes, yes. So um, my, my postdoctoral work was in clinical toxicology. Um, and so my role was twofold at the Children's Hospital Buffalo. I was the clinical pharmacist for uh, a 200 bed uh, pediatric high risk maternity uh, hospital, but I was also the administrative director for a regional poison center covering about um, 3 million individuals in Western New York. And those calls ranged from you know, um, sort of non-toxic, I ate, you know, a child swallowed a penny um, to, you know, major overdoses um, for, and, and actually, you know, animals as well as uh, as well as human overdoses. So interesting plant exposures, venomous creature exposures, uh, as well as med medicinal. So I was there for about 10 years. Wow. That sounds extremely intense. It was high, high pressure when you, you have right. somebody on the phone. <laughs> wow. Do you think that work has helped inform your overall patient advocacy work? Oh, absolutely. Um, when you're in that high pressure situation and you have to make some decisions based on sometimes just animal data alone, and you're making a clinical decision for a human that's in serious condition, um, I think it un underscores the importance of pa patients, families, and doctors to fully understand, um, you know, the information in front of them and empower them to make some decisions. So um, absolutely, I think it's made me a better advocate. That, that's, that's really interesting. And so you've been obviously now working as an advocate at AGTC for a while. Are there any memorable moments that come to mind for uh, patients and families that you've been working with uh, for the XLRP or achromatopsia trials? Um, there, there have been so many over the last four years. Um, you know, we, we recently had two families with children who were waiting years uh, to join the achromatopsia trials. And one of the families was in Canada and they were trying to get to one of our Boston sites. Um, and we ran into some COVID challenges, uh, surprise. Um, you know, one of the things we had to do was contact border control. Um, we contacted Fighting Blindness Canada, trying to get a medical exemption for the two week uh, quarantine that they were going to have to undergo. Um, you know, this is one of those things where you just try to get as much information as possible to help them make a decision. and and. You know, this is COVID was an unusual situation. But right. It it presented new challenges in your advocacy role, I'm sure. So one thing I wanted to um, have you explain to our um, listeners, I know a lot of people know what RP is and X-linked RP is just one of the common forms of RP. Can you tell people what achromatopsia is? Sure. Um, achromatopsia is an inherited retinal disorder. It's fairly rare. Um, there's about 20,000 cases in the U.S. It is caused by one of six genetic mutations, uh, most commonly caused by a mutation in the CNGA3 or CNGB3 gene. And these individuals are born blind, are born with a poor visual acuity, legally blind. They also um, 
ha- it's a disease of the cones. So they're, they're, um, you know, close up vision, their fine motor skills are affected. So they have poor visual acuity. Um, they're very light sensitive um, in the sense that they need very dark uh, glasses or contacts to, to manage in bright sunlight. And they also lack the ability to perceive color. And those are the three major signs and symptoms of achromatopsia. Right. I guess thinking about it, it's almost the reverse of RP. Correct. Where RP, with RP, a lot of people maintain some central vision. They have problems seeing in dim or dark settings where achromatopsia, it's just the opposite. Exactly. That's exactly. The difference is that achromatopsia is not progressive. I mean, there may be some deterioration of cones over time, but they're born with this. And so um, it's not a matter of having great vision when they're born and then getting worse over time, as you see with RP, um, that they're actually born legally blind. Right. And isn't one of the endpoints that you're evaluating in the achromatopsia trial light sensitivity? But unlike improving somebody's light sensitivity, you're in achromatopsia, you're actually trying to make them less light sensitive so they're not so uncomfortable. Isn't that correct? Correct. Correct. Because my understanding is that people with achromatopsia, it can actually be painful for them to be in a brightly lit situation. Yes, and actually, actually outside out, in the bright sun. Mm-hmm. Seek out dark, um, dark settings. Yeah, I, I always have a, a tough time wrapping my head around that because I'm so used to talking to RP patients who, um, again, want want better light perception. So can you give us a quick update on what's going on in both the XLRP and achromatopsia gene therapy trials? Sure. So with achromatopsia, we have completed the phase one and phase two for adults. And as you know, phase one is where we demonstrate that it's safe. And phase two, we, as in a larger number of individuals, we're trying to see if there's a biologic signal to see if it works. Um, so we st- always start with adults. Um, and we've now, um, the results so far have been encouraging in both safety and in and efficacy. We recently reported the first improvements in visual sensitivity or light discomfort. And according to our patient research, those are the most bothersome aspects of the condition that light discomfort. And they've also shown that there's some sustained improvements in their visual sensitivity. Um, and at this point, we're about 12 months out. So. We're given that good safety profile and and some encouraging um, efficacy results. We've now started treating, um, we've just now been enrolling children uh, aged four to eight. So adults first, then pediatrics. So we're still finishing up those that phase one, two, four for children. Um, And we'll have some additional readouts and um, efficacy results later this summer. That's great. And we'll be sure to report on those. We mean the foundation fighting blindness, so we look forward to hearing those results. And so what's the latest on XLRP? So with XLRP, we recently reported that we continue to see a a favorable safety profile. Um, We had no dose limiting toxicity in all patients across our six dosing groups. Um, And at the 12 months um, time point, we just reported uh, those who were treated uh, centrally. Um, we saw measurable improvements in visual sensitivity as well as the majority showing stable or improvement in their visual acuity as well. Um, we've initiated uh, a, two additional trials. The first one called, uh, they're both called the scenic trials, but the first one is called Skyline. Um, we're already enrolling in this one um, where we're randomizing 12 patients to one of two dosing groups, both of those those doses have been, have demonstrated some benefit in the earlier trial. And then later this year, we'll begin screening for VISTA, which is our phase two, three trial. Um, that will be a larger trial uh, in which individuals will be randomized to one of three groups. Um, two of the groups will be treated in one eye initially. And then the third group is our control group, uh, meaning that they'll be observed for a year before they receive treatment. 
Yeah, the uh, launch of the phase two, three is really exciting because if that goes well, then there's a reasonable chance that you'll go to the FDA for approval. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> we need to get it, the treatment. Exactly. Into and through the phase two, three. Um, can you talk about anything else that is in the AGTC pipeline? <laughs> I know people can't see, but Jill's shaking her head no, but she's <laughs> giving me a hard time. Absolutely. I mean, so in addition to our egg chromatopsia and XLRP trials, um, we have some preclinical programs um, in optogenetics, um, some other ophthalmology programs. Uh, programs, um, our CNS, pro, central nervous system uh, programs, as well as otology, which is uh, obviously the ear. Um, our optogenetics program is being developed in collaboration with Bionic Sight, and they are managing their clinical trial. We are just a partner in that. And our otology program is partnered with all autonomy. Um, so in addition to um, our product pipeline, we've got um, uh, significant um, intellectual property portfolio and experience in the design of gene therapy products, including capsids, promoters, et cetera, which we're also partnering with, in, with other companies uh, to share our expertise. That's great. I, I know that developing the actual gene therapy, um, engineering that virus is not a trivial thing. I know when we talk about gene therapy, we say it's an injection of the healthy gene underneath the eye or underneath the retina. And it sounds so simple, but to develop that actual vector to do that is, is quite, uh, quite complicated. It is the biggest challenge that all gene therapy companies have. I mean, uh, gene therapy manufacturing and development is, is the number one challenge for these types of um, regenerative treatments, if you will. Right. So I know a lot of people um, out there are interested in clinical trials, whether they're interested in AGTC's trials or another sponsor's trials. Can you talk about what people should expect uh, or think about if they're um, interested in a clinical trial? Absolutely. I, I think that's the, as I mentioned earlier, my role is to help patients understand what the expectations are in order for them to make an informed decision. And I think the most important consideration is the time commitment. Certainly adverse events, et cetera, are important, but more, I think important for them to consider whether they're going to join a trial is to understand that time commitment. The IRD trials, not just ours, but others um, are generally five years or longer in some studies, meaning that the most time being that they spend at the trial site um, is about 12 visits in the first year. After that, it's an annual visit up to five years. Um, but on average, you know, it's, it, it's a, a huge time commitment, um, not just for the individual who's undergoing that treatment, but for the family as well. Um, they have to make, take time off from school or work, find daycare for other kids, et cetera. So, the time commitment is certainly uh, the biggest issue. And if people need to travel, in other words, get on a plane or maybe stay at a hotel, uh, AGTC normally picks up those expenses, correct? In our case, yes. Um, I would not say that that's the case for every trial out there. Um, you know, in some cases I've seen where the companies are not paying for those types of visits. Certainly the the medical costs associated with it, every company will cover. Uh, AGTC does cover the travel, the lodging, the food, um, not just for that individual, but for a companion. We don't expect a visually impaired individual to travel by themselves. So we, we will take care of that for the family uh, for every visit that they have to uh, attend. That's great. Uh, that, that's very helpful. As you said, there's the time commitment, but the money the support sure helps as well. So I just want to remind our listeners that if they're interested in information about um, these trials, we stay up to date on the news and you can visit fightingblindness.org to get the latest news on these trials and other trials. 
if you have a, uh, a question or a comment related to the podcast itself, you can send an email to podcast at fightingblindness.org. And Jill, I just want to thank you for taking a little time out of your busy day to talk about your role, talk about the trials. I, I know patients and families out there are always eager for information and to learn. And this was a very helpful exercise in, in educating our community. So thank you. Well, thank you. And if they want to learn more about our trials, please come to agtc.com, you know, send us a question um, and we'll, we'll provide them with direction on how they can get involved. And I'll echo that. I know you have a great website with a lot of good information. So thank you again, Jill. And thanks everyone out there for joining us. And please tune in for our next podcast. This has been Eye on the Cure. To help us win the fight, please donate at foundationfightingblindness.org.